So today I'm going to be talking about network approaches for ecology and conservation and highlighting some questions that I see as pressing for this field to tackle and also highlighting some of the work that I've done uh, as in collaboration with students and postdocs in my lab um, and other groups of interdisciplinary researchers. So we know that ecosystems are complex and connected, even at really local scales. This is a simplification of a coastal ecosystem and the species interactions and components that are interacting within them. And these local ecosystems are embedded in larger systems that are increasingly connected by humans. So this map shows just how connected our planet is, where the light colors are showing all places that are only within one day of travel time to major urban areas. And the blue lines are highlighting transportation and shipping routes. So humans are adding to this complexity that already exists in ecosystems by increasing globalization. And this complexity creates challenges for understanding how global change is modifying ecosystems and for designing effective management and conservation. And in this talk, I'm going to highlight ways that networks and network science can help with these challenges. So first, networks can help us deal with this large complexity of the planet. They provide useful simplifications of really dynamic and complicated systems that are connected. So for example, we have here nodes that are linked with edges that can represent things like locations that are connected through species moving or interactions between species within systems. And this simplification can help us identify key structures and connections within systems and networks. For example, if we care about diffusion or spread processes, um, we might use networks to identify clusters and also key uh, bottlenecks in the system for spread. Or we can use networks to identify key nodes, whether they're keystone species or patches that are really important for spread of invasive species. So here the blue nodes are most connected and the red are least connected, as an example. Network approaches are also really flexible. Network science is really a diverse field with different approaches from really dynamic representations of connected systems to simpler ones that just use typology, like the presence or absence of an edge. And it's also flexible for integrating different types of data where we might have really detailed quantitative descriptions of species interaction strengths um, or only qualitative expert opinion on what components of a system are connected. So networks provide a uniform set of approaches to deal with varying degrees of complexity and data types. And another key thing that networks can do is let us leverage toolkits from diverse fields, from computer science and physics to sociology and social network analysis. There's a wide range of tools that are available, in some cases off the shelf, um, applied for different contexts that we can port into ecology. And finally, the thesis of this talk is that networks are a useful tool for science in ecology as well as management because many of our systems and processes within the systems can lend themselves to a network representation. So for instance, we, if we want to model a food web or represent a food web in the salt marsh, we could have species as nodes and their um, interactions or feeding relationships as edges or Turning to this case of invasive species, we can model a metapopulation and spread across a landscape using network approaches. And this can help us identify nodes or areas that are really crucial or central to the spread of invasive species, for example. So next I'm going to talk through some particular examples to motivate why I think networks can be a useful tool for ecology management. So the first example is that threats to ecosystems are really hard to anticipate when species interact. So if we're again returning to this salt marsh ecosystem and thinking about the impacts of ocean acidification and pollution to this bivalve species, 
um, we might anticipate that that bivalve species will decline or be extirpated, but this can also lead to some complex secondary effects by removing key resources for species that depend on that, that initial species. Um, then this is similarly analogous when we're talking about or thinking about which species to protect or reintroduce. So if we reintroduce the species that could have complex ramifications for the species that it interacts with uh, in the network. The second motivating example is spatial management of invasive species. And here I'm going to draw on the example of feral swine in the southeast US where these swine will be moved around the landscape by people to hunt, but also they move on their own and they can break in and damage agricultural crops, native ecosystems, and spread disease. So one key thing to think about is the potential for unintended consequences and spillover. And let's imagine that this is my patch of land and I am successfully eradicating or investing in eradicating the feral swine. So that could have some positive benefits for my neighbors who may not be managing their feral swine populations. But there's also potentially this externality that when my neighbor doesn't eradicate the swine, it can return to my property and also facilitate spread. And these are just two examples that can be represented and modeled using networks and provide some insight. I'm going to next dig a little bit deeper into that first example to highlight the relationship between food webs and ecosystem services. And then after that, I'm going to highlight some frontiers in the field and some big questions that I see from my perspective of research, which is typically thinking about ecology and human dominated systems um, to kick off a discussion that we'll have after this talk. So returning to this first example, I'm going to draw on some cases that um, can highlight the use of networks to understand the consequences of threats to coastal food webs for both species and people. And when I'm talking about consequences for people, I'm going to be referring to ecosystem services or nature's contribution to human well-being. Those can be uh, services like production of timber or food with direct market value, or services like pollination or water filtration, um, nutrient cycling that supports water quality, or biodiversity in itself as a cultural service. So the, the question or why I chose this as an example, one, because it's the work that we do in my lab, but also I think that networks provide new insights into how to study and manage ecosystem services. One key reason for that is that most work on ecosystem services to date focuses on species that directly provide services like single species management in fisheries, or bird watching, focusing on the set of birds in a particular place. And this could potentially miss some species that may play indirect roles in services or potential threats that are ignored or omitted by focusing only on a particular group of species. So why we're going to be using networks is to address this question. Are we missing some critical indirect threats to services or are we ignoring species that are indirectly supporting services through these interactions? So what we're doing here, I'm going to highlight two sets of projects led by one by Aislinn Keyes, who's going to give a lightning talk later on, who's a PhD student in my lab at CU Boulder, and Hui Xiao, who is a collaborator um, during her PhD work at University of Queensland. And so to address this question about indirect consequences of species interactions for services, we're linking the ecology of services to the services using networks, where we're representing the species as nodes in the network and their interactions, but then also adding ecosystem services as nodes in this network. So we can identify the species that directly provide the services and then embed those services in these food webs. And this is one example of the flexibility of network approaches to accommodate different types of nodes and um, edges here. So
So this can potentially reveal indirect impacts to species and services. For instance, in this case, say we lost the species with an X here, we know from ecological food web studies that that could have secondary consequences leading to these cascading extinctions where because the species um, up here are losing its resource, they can also be lost secondarily. And we then extend these ideas to thinking about the potential losses of ecosystem services through these indirect effects. And I'm gonna provide a couple of examples from work led by Aislinn. And she's giving a lightning talk after, so I'm not gonna reveal too much. But we're, this provides an example of how we can ask questions of how much or whether species contribute indirectly to ecosystem services and whether food web robustness is correlated with or decoupled from ecosystem service robustness. And you can imagine because ecosystem services are provided by these ecosystems in which species interact, that they might be related. But on the other hand, potentially the species that are critical for the persistence of food webs may be different than the ones that are critical for the persistence of services. So we use networks to address both of these questions. So first, we add real ecosystem services as nodes in a coastal food web, things like water filtration provided by bivalves to fishing, bird watching, and shoreline stabilization by coastal vegetation and salt marsh grasses. And then we add these again as nodes in this network where now we have nodes that are species in yellow and feeding interactions in gray among spe between species. And then the services where the black lines are representing species that directly provide services. So we scale this to an ecosystem with around 160 species and seven services. And doing this allows us to first look at the species that might play some indirect role in providing services by supporting the services. So here you can see species that directly provide each of these services in pink that we call ecosystem service providers. And you can see the species that play some indirect role in green. And it's about three or four times as many species have some role indirectly. And this is something that without a network perspective, we might not have seen by focusing only on the direct service providers. So then we calculate the robustness for food webs and compare that to the robustness of ecosystem services. And we do this simulating 12 different patterns of species loss where we're directly removing species depending on things like their um, biomass or relative abundance, their connectivity or connectedness in the network randomly. Um, and then we're looking at the consequences, the indirect consequences for both species and services and using robustness metrics that Aislin will talk about to quantify. So we'll track the secondary extinctions for species and for services. And we can compare how these different patterns of species losses affect services versus species. And I won't go too much into the results, but we can find using these approaches that food webs and ecosystem service robustness are highly related. And for more details, you should check out Aislinn's talk in the lightning session two today that's going to talk about this at greater length. So because we found that the persistence of food webs and of ecosystem services can be highly related and both could respond similarly to patterns of species losses, this also raises the question, is there some potential for win-wins when managing for multiple objectives? And we know that conservation has traditionally focused on biodiversity in its own right, but in more recent years, conservation has broadened to be focused on biodiversity, but also these other ecosystem services like carbon and recreation and food production. And while we know that these objectives are related, they are still distinct management objectives. So we're considering whether or not considering species interactions could potentially reveal win-wins or management that could achieve multiple objectives. 
So now I'm going to talk about work led by Hui Xiao and collaborators at CSIRO, INRA, and University of Queensland, where we ask this question. Do species interactions affect the alignment of management strategies for multiple objectives? So particularly, we look at whether management targeting biodiversity can actually give high levels of ecosystem services and vice versa. And we ask how network structure can impact these potential trade-offs. So to do this, we develop a novel approach that couples networks with decision theory and frame this problem as an optimization problem where we're aiming to find which species are optimal to protect in order to maximize the total number of species that are uh, extant, so that's our biodiversity objective, or the total value of ecosystem services. So for each time period, we're considering that species depend on one another, some species provide services, and we're selecting a species to optimally protect for each of these objectives. To do this, we simulate 360 networks with different features and also illustrate this theory on a salt marsh case study that's um, using the same data, but a simplified form that is used in Aislinn's project. So a key thing that we're doing here is evaluating how pursuing one objective affects the other. So in each time period, we look at the sequence um, or which species to protect for the biodiversity strategy versus the ecosystem services strategy and looking at the sequences of protection um, that we would want to pursue for each. And you can imagine that these might not be the same species that are gonna be optimal to protect as the main priority. So then what we do is apply the protection priorities for the ecosystem services strategy to the network to look at how those do in terms of biodiversity relative to pursuing the biodiversity objective in its own right. And then the second part of this is considering how network structure might impact trade-offs. So we also varied various attributes of network structure to address this question. First, we ask whether uh, the strategies in terms of protection priorities will be more similar as connectivity is higher. So this could be true because highly connected species have been identified as conservation priorities for services and conservation. Um, and in some cases, highly connected species can increase food web stability. So we vary uh, the, the connectivity holding the number of services and species constant. The next attribute that we look at is whether considering more services will lead to more similar species protection priorities and outcomes. And one reason that might be the case is because as we consider more functions and services, empirical work has revealed that this actually will lead to more species being necessary to sustain multiple functions and services. And um, other work that I've done has shown that this can actually raise the optimal number of species to protect on the basis of ecosystem services. And then finally, we look at how the trophic level of species providing services can affect trade-offs by uh, assigning ecosystem services to basal species, the top trophic level, or randomly assigned trophic levels. And what we find is trade-offs between achieving an ecosystem service and biodiversity objective in almost all cases. Um, we did not find that connectivity or considering more services decreased this trade-off, but we did find some evidence that de it depends on which trophic level is providing the service, whether or not there's gonna be a strong trade-off. So in particular, um, if we look at this graph, here's the trophic level providing the service. So basal randomly assigned or from the top. And then the y-axis is showing the percent change in the objective or outcome um, 
where we're applying the biodiversity strategy compared to the ecosystem service strategy. So this is the case where uh, this line is the best you can do in terms of applying the biodiversity strategy for the biodiversity objective. And then here is the ecosystem service strategy for the biodiversity objective. And you can see in all other cases, except for when basal species provide the service, that you could do a lot better applying the biodiversity strategy for biodiversity, um, except in this case where there's very little trade-off. And so that helps to reveal what conditions we might expect strong or weak trade-offs when pursuing multiple objectives in ecosystem management of food webs. So in terms of conclusions from this first part showing examples of the utility of networks, um, by integrating ecosystem services as nodes in the network, using that flexible representation of this really complicated system, reveals and helps us understand species indirectly critical for ecosystem services and something more broad about the consequences of species loss directly and indirectly in these systems. And then the second example showed how network tools can be integrated with other methods. Here, um, approaches from decision theory. And in this approach, we, we revealed trade-offs between multiple management goals and some conditions under which those trade-offs could potentially be minimized. So next I'm going to talk about some areas that interest me as frontiers in this field and some examples to kick off a discussion. The first frontier is returning to these systems where we have ecosystems that are actually embedded and interacting with human systems. And there's an increasing number of work that's starting to integrate these social ecological networks using multi-layer network approaches, where we have the species interactions and collaboration in the social layer as the interactions, and then some connection between the layers in this network. And in, in order to do this, collaborations across disciplines are needed, but networks are really valuable in that they provide a common language and toolkit to do this. So um, my group and is starting to work with some social scientists who work on governance issues to try to apply some of these approaches to understand ecosystem services across scales through work at Sysinc, um, as an example. And we're also thinking about these approaches in the context of management of real world systems. And I just wanted to provide this as an example for why I think this topic is so important. And Invasion really illustrates this. Um, this is a, an example that's very characteristic of a lot of invasive species where humans are primarily the ones responsible for spreading zebra mussel by recreational boats. You can see that this is the prop on a boat covered in zebra mussel and when the boat goes out of the water it's transported potentially to another lake and this can lead to long-distance dispersal of these organisms. Um, so human behavior and connectivity is really critical for predicting or understanding or managing invasions like this. And it could also potentially highlight other types of management interventions um, that are really targeting human behavior or the social network. And these are some questions that we're pursuing um, with Jamie Ashander, who's going to give a lightning talk with a great team of economists and ecologists. The, the next frontier that I see is this problem of how do we scale up to larger systems. Of course, we can simulate dynamics in massive simulations that are becoming more accessible with increasing computational power, but it becomes really intractable at some stage or hard to interpret. So a key question that I see is what can we learn from the structure of smaller systems that could be scaled up to more complex landscapes where we have many different um, potential meta-communities, for example. 
And I just want to highlight Jamie Ashander's talk that's going to be in session one today, where he's going to show some progress towards this frontier using network structure to, to guide near optimal management of invasive species in a landscape scale using the zebra mussel example that I highlighted. Um, and in this case, I'll just highlight some of the components. We're identifying structure of the network, looking at optimal interventions at smaller systems, and then seeing how well network metrics can predict those optimal interventions in hopes of generalizing to larger systems. So that's just a teaser for Jamie's talk that's to come. Um, the next frontier that I see is guidance for management. So can we, using network, networks and ecology, move from describing patterns in networks to prescribing management strategies? And I think a key question in answering that is to what extent can the structure of the system um, actually predict outcomes in terms of dynamics that can guide management so that we could potentially ignore those dynamics that are sometimes um, hard to quantify or observe. And then finally, related to all of this, I think that studies that can identify the value of having more complexity um, and under which cases it's really important to incorporate those, that complexity and in other cases where it's okay to ignore. So um, the questions there that I hope we can discuss after are when are simpler representations of systems okay? And for which research or management aims can we ignore this complexity in systems? So in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that networks can provide a useful tool for ecological science and management. And I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially Aislinn, Jamie, and Hui, whose work I highlighted, um, and some of our funding.